Amen. If you've got your Bible, turn over to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. If you don't have one, uh, we'll have the scriptures here on the screens for you. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 and uh, verse 13, it says, Christ, he has redeemed us from the curse of the law and all the law's demands upon me. Now, this is a real interesting scripture because you hear a lot of Christians talk about how they're praying uh, for God to set them free, uh, praying for God to set them free from sickness and disease, praying for, and asking God, trying to get God to get them free of addictions, trying to get God to get them free of financial issues and problems, uh, trying to get God to get them uh, free of depression and, and mental illnesses and all of these things. But it's actually pretty interesting when you read your Bible and find out what God has to say. Uh, it says that Christ, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. So what he's letting us know is that uh, you don't have to try to get free. Uh, Jesus already made you free. Now, that goes absolutely contrary to, to what you hear a lot of Christians talking about and what a lot of uh, preachers are preaching is that, you know, you need to do this and you need to do that so that God will set you free. And you hear people praying, God set me free. But, but you're going to see here this morning, uh, you don't need to try to get free. Jesus already got you free. Now, see, if you don't understand that you're already free, then you're going to spend all your, trying, all your time trying to get free. But see, the last, last month, we've been talking about living a supernatural life. The supernatural life. And to live the supernatural life, or in other words, to go beyond ordinary and live an extraordinary life, or you could say to go beyond living uh, the way this world does and, and what they call their, their normalcy there, to go beyond that, you got to know that you are free. Because if you don't know that you're free, then you're going to go through life like everybody else trying to get free. And while you're trying to get free, you're going to be looking at all of these other sources to get you free instead of looking to the source who already made you free. It's interesting, this word redeem here, uh, this word redeem, redemption, it, it, it literally comes from a Greek word that means uh, to set free from a slave market. And it gives you the picture of a person who would be a, a buyer, or you could call a redeemer, who would go into a slave market to buy a slave for the sole purpose of setting them free and to change their location. And this is exactly what it's talking about, how Christ, he redeemed us. He came into this earth, or you could say he came into the slave market, and he bought you and I who were slaves, unto sin, slaves unto Satan. He bought us with a sole intention, the sole purpose of setting us free. Setting us free. It says, Christ, he has redeemed us. And notice it's past tense, right? He, is, he has. So has is what? That means in the past. He has redeemed us. So if he has redeemed us, then that means you are already redeemed. You're already free. You're already free. Now, if you know that you're already free, then you'll start living like a free man. You'll start living like a free woman. And then you'll start thinking like a free man. Start thinking like a free woman. You'll start talking like a free man. Talking like a free woman. Instead of going around like most Christians and talking like they're a slave still. How am I going to get out of this? How am I going to get out of that? God, oh God, why won't you get me free of this? Why won't you set me free? And he's already telling you that he already did. It's like the story of this farmer, you know, he, this farmer, and he had some goats, and he noticed one day uh, one of his goats was missing. And one of his friends called him and, and told him he found his goat in a ditch, and somebody had stolen one of his goats, and they had tied the goat's legs together, all four legs together, and uh, when he saw that he was caught, he threw the goat out of the truck and threw him into a ditch. And so the goat had been there a couple of days just tied up, you know, all dehydrated and everything, but his legs were tied up. And so the farmer, he went and found his goat. And he untied the goat, untied his legs. And he slapped him on the rear end and said, get up, goat. And the goat just laid there. And went, he reached down, slapped him on the rear and said, goat, get up. And the goat just laid there with his legs together, untied with legs together and just looked at him. And the farmer slapped him on the rear and said, goat, get up. And the goat just laid there with his legs together. So the farmer reached down, picked up the goat, set him on his legs. And then all of a sudden, the goat realized he was free. And yet, he had been free from the very time that the farmer untied his legs. But, it, but he was so used to captivity by that point, he didn't even try to move. He just assumed he was still bound. And yet, that right there, friends, is where the vast majority of Christians are today. The rope's already been taken off. 
You've already been set free, but most Christians are still laying there. Meh. And Jesus already took the rope off and set you free and, and trying to get you to realize you're already free. That's why if you read through the epistles, uh, what would be the letters of, of, of Paul to the church, basically from Romans all the way down to the end there, you read that and, and you'll find that everything is pretty much all past tense. Everything's already been done. You're already redeemed, you're already healed, you're already set free. And in the mind of God, all these things are already done because it was already accomplished in Christ. So you're already set free. You're already redeemed. So how, how are you set free, and what was it that really set you free? I mean, we understand right there, it says Christ, He's redeemed us from the curse of the law. Let's look at a couple of scriptures here so you can see how this was actually accomplished and so which you can put your faith in. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, we're going to kind of read through these a little quick, but Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, in Him, or in Christ, we have what? We have redemption. So again, that same Greek word that, that means uh, for someone, a redeemer, a buyer to go into a slave market and, and buy a slave for the sole purpose of setting them free. It says, in Christ we have redemption. So we've been set free and, and we've changed locations. In Him we have redemption through what? Through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. So it's, it's interesting here, you're going to see this combination all throughout this. You're going to see redemption, and you're going to see the blood, and you're going to see uh, sin. So we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and, and a, a part of that goes with that is the forgiveness of sins. And it's a real important piece here. He says, so we have redemption through His blood, uh, the forgiveness of sins. Romans chapter 3, if you turn over there, Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Romans 3, verse 24, it says, Being justified freely by His grace through what? Redemption. And what's that word redemption about? It's about buying a slave, changing their location, and setting them free. It said, We've been justified freely by His grace through redemption that's where? In Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation. In other words, you could just say an offering. And that's what it means, an offering to restore back to favor, but... He said he set forth as an offering by what? By his blood. So we see redemption. We have been redeemed, and we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then this part, what's the next part? Through what? Redeemed by his blood through faith. So see, there, there's a faith piece that's got to go along with what Jesus already did. And, and this is the key. This is the deal is that Jesus, he's already redeemed everyone, but if you don't know uh, what he's done, if you don't know what the blood has accomplished, then you can't put your faith in it. And if you can't put your faith in it, then you're going to go through life uh, living like everybody else who thinks that they're still bound, those that are in Christ. So he said, God, he set forth as an offering through, by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over what? The sins that were previously committed. So you see redemption, you see the blood, and you see uh, this thing about sins. It says the sins that were previously committed. Verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he would be what? He'd be, the ju he'd be just and he would be what? He'd be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Well, you are the one. If you have faith in Jesus, faith in the blood, then he's letting you know that you have been justified. Just as if you had never sinned, that is the way that God sees you and I. And because you, you are seen that way, and you have been bought, you have been redeemed, you, you've been taken away from the curse of the law and all the laws demands upon you, all the effects of that curse. So think about it. Uh, the curse came into effect when? When Adam and Eve sinned, right? Right? When they sinned, and that's when the curse came upon the earth. Why? Because Adam and Eve, they took the authority. They were the gods on this earth. They took the authority that God had given them, and they turned around and gave it to who? Satan, the devil. They gave it to him. And then as a result, a curse came upon the earth. And, and you'll see that before the curse came, there was no sickness. There was no disease. There was no death. There was no lack. There was no need. But when the curse came upon, all of a sudden, people start dying, 
There's sickness, disease, there's struggle. There's all of these things. Why? Because the curse came. And yet he's letting you know in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, Jesus, because of his sacrifice, he redeemed you from that curse. In other words, he took you out from under that. He changed your location and he sets you free. So that even though you are in this earth, you don't have to live as from this earth. You don't have to live as a, 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 under the curse upon this earth. It may sound like a little bit of science fiction, but it's true. And it's all through here. So, redemption, the blood, forgiveness of sin, right? And then look over at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Now think about it. If there's a firstborn, there's got to be a secondborn. There's a firstborn, there's got to be a secondborn. Jesus was the firstborn. I wonder who were the secondborn. And the thirdborn, the fourthborn, the fifth. You and me. He was the firstborn. He's the firstborn from the what? From the dead. Now, he wasn't the first one to be raised from physical death, was he? No. Because if you read in the Old Testament, you see lots of people that were raised from the dead, don't you? If you don't believe me, then go read your Bible. There's lots of them there. So it wasn't that Jesus was the firstborn from physical death. He was the firstborn from spiritual death. So those that don't believe Jesus died spiritually, he had to. Because if he wouldn't have, then redemption wouldn't be available for you and I. He died spiritually. It's right here, and there's plenty to back it up. He died spiritually. He had to. Because that was a part of the curse. Sp uh, spiritual a separation from God. That's why Jesus was in such stress and agony, you know, crying out for God to, in, in uh, John 17, the garden against him. He said, God, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. It wasn't all, not only just the physical pain he was going to endure, it was also going to be uh, the spiritual pain of becoming every sin, every sickness, every disease, and taking that upon him, and then ultimately being separated from God. He was the firstborn from the dead. But that's why Jesus said it's so vitally important in John chapter 3, when he was talking to Nicodemus, he said, it's so vitally important for you and I to be born again. Why do we need to be born again? Well, so that we could be one with him. So we'd be the second born. He is the, he is the, the brother. He's the brother, our big brother. He's the first born uh, from the dead. It says, and the ruler over the, the kings of the earth. Well, who do you think are those kings? Jesus, he's the king of what? Kings, and he's the Lord of? Well, who do you think those kings and those lords are? Well, keep reading. It says, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and did what? Washed us from our sins in his what? Blood. And verse 6, and he has made us to be what? Kings. Oh, see, y'all thought I was making that up. No, it's right there. He made us to be what? Kings. And he made us to be priests to his God and Father, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. So Jesus, he's the firstborn from among the dead. Because of what Jesus did, he provided redemption for you and I so we could be born again, so we could be taken out from among the curse of the law and all the laws demands upon us, so we could change locations. That's why the Bible tells us, God tells us that we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light the kingdom of his dear son. I mean, it's all through there. And because of that, that's why it says we have been washed, we've been cleansed by the blood of the lamb. And because of that, we can stand on this earth as a king and as a priest, uh, going back to God's original plan, his original intention for mankind in the very beginning. Jesus came to get your and I positioned back. What God had planned, what, what you see in Genesis chapter 2, and three, what God had planned for man, Jesus came to get our position back. And our position was that of a king, that of a priest, that as a God on this planet, on this earth, and not being ruled by the curse on, on this earth. In other words, he took us out from under the curse and he put us under the blessing. He restored us back under favor so we could live on this earth just like a child of God. Just like Jesus did on the earth. And yet that's not the only one. Look over at Hebrews chapter 9. Now, if you haven't got your Bible reading in a while, we're going to make sure you catch up today. We're going to read some scriptures. Hebrews chapter 9 
And verse 18, I love Hebrews 9 and 10. Some really good stuff here, really good truths. Hebrews 9 and verse 18, it says, Therefore, not even the first covenant, talking about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, it wasn't dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and the people. Now, can you imagine standing there in church, and we get a whole bucket of blood, and we just start slinging it on you? Just sprinkling you all with blood. But see, there's no covenant there. There's no covenant there without it being sealed and ratified in blood. And this was going on under the old covenant. Uh, there wasn't the blood of Jesus available. It, it was a type and shadow of things to come. There was the blood of, of bulls and goats. And so he sprinkled the book of the covenant. He sprinkled all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And then he likewise sprinkled the blood or with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And it says, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood there is no remission. In other words, there is no forgiveness. Uh, there is no redemption. There is no setting free without blood. Without blood. And if you go on down a couple of verses to verse 26, it says, Jesus would then have to suffer often since the foundation of the world, because it's talking about uh, if the sacrifice wasn't good, good enough, like the, the priest before, they had to go in once a year, continue doing it. But it says, now, once at the end of the ages, now check this out, this is a powerful truth. It says, at the end of the ages, Jesus, he has appeared to put away what? He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So see, right here, guys, he, he's letting you know we don't have a sin problem anymore. Now, you may look around the world and say, uh, you must be joking, Jack. There is a sin problem. No, 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 no. We don't have a sin problem. We got a sinner problem. We don't have a sin problem. But see, you can get rid of the sinner problem. All they got to do is turn around and accept the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the firstborn from among the dead, who because of His blood and because of His grace provided redemption so they could be free. There's no more sin problem anymore. That's why it tells us Jesus, because of His blood, He set us free. And the thing is, the wonderful truth is, when you find out that when the sin problem has been done away with, the curse problem has been done away with. When the sin problem has been done away with, the curse problem has been done away with. When sin's been done away with, the curse has been done away with. Now, it, it gets down to this. If you know you're redeemed, or you could say it like this, if you know you're forgiven, then you know you're redeemed. If you know that you're forgiven, then you know that you are set free. If you know you're forgiven, you know you're set free. And then he goes on to give you more evidence here. By the sacrifice himself. And if you go on to, down to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, just go down a few scriptures. Down to verse uh, 12, Hebrews 10, 12. It says, but this man, talking about Jesus, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. He perfected how long? Forever. Those who are being sanctified, that's you and me. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And then he adds, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will do what? I will remember them no more. Now where there is remission of these sins, there is no longer an offering for what? Sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now look at verse, go back to verse 12, it says, but Jesus, this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice, he did what? What did he do? He sat down. Why did he sit down? Because the job was done. He sat down. So see, here's another fact for you. If Jesus is seated, that means you're free. 
I said, if Jesus is seated, that means you're free. Too many Christians, oh God, uh, would you do this? I need, I need you to deliver me. I need you to set me free. No, 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 no. That, that is not the thing to be saying. That's not the question to be asking God, why aren't you? The question to be asking is, is Jesus seated at the right hand of God? If the answer is yes, then the answer to your problem is yes. You've already been set free. You don't have to cry. You don't have to beg. You don't have to plead. God set me free. God deliver me. He's already letting you know if Jesus is seated, you're already free. If Jesus is seated, <laughs> if Jesus is seated you're already free. So what, what does your body need to be free of? What does your mind need to be free of? Because He's letting you know you're already free. You just need to put your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ that already made you free. Because if the sin's problem's been done away with, then the curse problem's been done away with. If the sin problem's been done away with, the addictions, the sickness, the disease, the lack, the need, all that's already been dealt with. All that's already been done because it says Jesus, He became sin. Who knew no sin, He became sin for us. And so if He became sin for us, then He also became all of the effects of sin for us. Why He took that and He became that. That's why the Bible says that when He was on the cross, He didn't even look like a human being anymore. Couldn't even recognize it. He didn't even look like a human being anymore because of everything that He had become. You know, we mentioned it last week. I mean, think about what happens with, with people when they, uh, they, they get a, a disease in their body and starts to eat away at them. And look at what just one disease or two diseases does to somebody's body. Take all the diseases of this world and put it into one body. And take all the sin of all of humanity and put that into one body and watch what it'll do. That's why the, the Bible says he was unrecognizable. Didn't even look like a human being anymore. But he became sin. And because he became sin, that means he also became the curse for you and I. And, and because you and I are united with him, we become one with him. Over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, If any man be what? In Christ. He becomes a brand new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And then it goes down to verse 21. And it tells us that he who knew no sin became sin. So we would become the righteousness of God. So everything that is right about God is everything that becomes right about you. You take on His righteousness. You don't just possess His righteousness. You become His righteousness. And therefore, everything that is right about God becomes you. And therefore, when you stand against everything that's wrong in this world because of the curse, it can't touch you. It can't come near you. It can't overcome you. Why? Because the blood of Jesus already sets you free. Galatians 3, verse 13 says, Christ, He has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And it was all because of His blood. See, Moses went about sprinkling the people, throwing blood. It was a bloody mess that day, you know. He was throwing blood over all the people, throwing blood on the book, throwing blood everywhere. He was covering them with the blood. But see, all the blood could do was just cover people for a year. But see, when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that the Bible says that all that became possible because Jesus, just like the high priest on the earth, Jesus went into the heavenly holy of holies and He presented the offering of His blood for once and for all, one time, so that you and I would be free. See, Moses was sprinkling the people. We got washed in it. See, this is where the, the statement uh, you hear a lot of Christians uh, especially kind of charismatic, spirit-filled Christians talk about, I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. You ever, anybody ever heard that statement? Growing up in my house, I heard it all the time. I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. Well, that's kind of what was going on. That's, they're throwing blood, they're slinging blood. I plead the blood. See, the Bible says that the blood of Jesus, it speaks of greater things than the blood of Abel. If you go back and read in Genesis, uh, when God he came up to Cain after Cain killed uh, Abel, and God says, the blood of Abel, it cries out unto me. But see, over in Hebrews, it says that the blood of Jesus, it says the blood of Jesus, it speaks of greater things than the blood of Abel. See, the blood of Abel was crying out for justice. It was crying out for justice. But, but the blood of Jesus, it cries out redeemed. The blood of Jesus cries out, you're free. The blood, blood of Abel is saying, uh, uh, I want justice. Uh, kill that one because of me. But the blood of Jesus is saying, I've already took it. They don't have to take it anymore. 
So when you're pleading the blood, you are declaring what the blood of Jesus has done for you. That's why we read over there in Hebrews, it said, come boldly, therefore, come boldly into the throne of grace. Why is the therefore, therefore? Because he's telling you your faith needs to be in the blood of what Jesus already did for you. That's why you can boldly come to the throne of grace, and that's why we are to hold fast our confession of faith. What is our confession? I am free. I'm free. That is my confession. And he said, hold fast to it. Why? Because it all comes down to faith and the blood of Jesus. Faith in the blood of Jesus not only uh, brought you forgiveness of sins, but it also set you free from the results of the sin, the effects of the sin. He said he's redeemed you from the curse of the law. Have you ever gone and read what some of the curses were? Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 28. In Deuteronomy 28, uh, probably about the first 15 scriptures there, 15 verses, he's laying out what the blessing is. And God had told the Israelites, he told them, he said, I set before you blessing and cursing. I set before you life and death. He said, I, I, I beg of you earnestly, choose life. But you've got a choice to make here. And, and the, the deal was is that if they did what God told them to do, then they got to experience the blessing of God upon their life. And for those that, that want to, to knock about God wanting you to be prosperous and, and be healthy and whole and all that stuff, then you've basically got to, to rip Deuteronomy 28 out of your Bible and a whole lot more. Because those first 15, 16 scriptures, it's basically about finances. It's basically about material things. It's basically about wealth. He said, blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the field, blessed shall be your, your basket, blessed shall be your barn. He goes through all those things and talks about if you do this, then this is going to be the result. But when you get to about verse 16, let me turn over there. When you get to about verse 16, uh, this is where he starts laying out what the curse is. And all of this came into effect uh, because of, of Adam's uh, goofy decision there. Deuteronomy 28 and uh, verse 15. So he starts laying out everything. And so verse 16 uh, through 20, he's talking about finances. And in uh, verse 21 and 22, he starts talking about sickness. And so you begin to see here that a part of the curse of the law, it was basically threefold. It was spiritual death, uh, poverty, and sickness. It was basically those three things. And he goes on from 15 uh, all the way to the end of the chapter uh, talking about what the curses are. But I want, you, I want to go through and look at a couple of these because I want you to see what you've already been redeemed from. What you've already been redeemed from. Because remember, what did the blood of Jesus already do? It already redeemed you from what we're about to read. Right? This is a really good resource for you if, if, uh, if you're looking for something good. It's called the Spirit-Filled Scripture Study Guide. Uh, by Mark Hankins. And, and so in here, they've gone through, and in uh, Deuteronomy 28, they went through and enlisted all, all of the things of the curse that are mentioned, but give the, uh, the Hebrew definition of what those words actually are. And so I wanted to read some of these to you, because a lot of these things that you're going to read here are things people are dealing, Christians are dealing with right now, and I want you to see you're already free from it. Okay? So uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, verse 22 uh, the King James, it uses the word uh, consumption. Uh, consumption and inflammation. Uh, that word consumption in the Hebrew uh, means infectious diseases. Uh, that word inflammation uh, in Hebrew is the cold. So see, you don't have to put up with the cold anymore. You don't have to put up with infectious diseases anymore. Uh, no more curse on that one. You've been set free from that. Uh, if you go on down to uh, verse 27, this is an interesting one. And uh, verse 27, it mentions the blotch of Egypt and, uh, and boils. And actually, in the Hebrew, what it's talking about is ulcers and inflammatory disease. So how many of you have been dealing with some inflammation? Well, no more of that. He's letting you know, you've already been, remember, Jesus, he set us free. From the curse of the law and all the laws demands upon, all the results from that. He already set you free. So he's already set you free from infectious diseases. He's already set you free from ulcers. He's already set you free from inflammation. And then here's a real good one. 
Uh, this word emeralds in verse 27, it's, it's literally, in the Hebrew, it's literally the word for, you ready? Tumors. It's literally the word for tumors. So you don't have to try to get free. See, Jesus didn't save you so you could try to turn around and save yourself. He didn't heal you so you could turn around and try to heal yourself. And yet if you listen to a lot of people, that's why they're giving, that's why they're, they're reading, that's why they're praying, that's why they're going to church, because they think in doing all these things, they're going to get God to do something. Well, if you're doing all those things to get God to do something, then what you are declaring is that what Jesus did was not good enough. But what Jesus did was more than good enough. Uh, also in verse 27, it mentions the word scabs. And this word scabs here in the Hebrew, uh, it's talking about an incurable itch, or what many of us would know uh, as eczema. That's right. Ex so if there's Christians dealing with eczema, hey, no more curse. You've already been set free of that. Why? Because of the blood. Jesus already took it. He already bore it. Uh, verse 28, it uses the word madness. And this word uh, madness uh, is literally talking about a diseased mind. People that are losing uh, their mind. Uh, people dealing uh, with mental issues. And he's already letting you know, no more curse. Already been set free of that. Jesus became that for me. Um... Here's another good one. In verse 59, the word, this is a real interesting, interesting one. The word, word plagues that's used in verse 59 is talking about strokes. He's already set you free from strokes and the results of strokes, the effects of strokes, malignant and lasting maladies, severe and lasting strokes and chronic sickness, extraordinary strokes and blows. And then if you say, well, Pastor Chad, you didn't mention one of the ones that I've been dealing with. Well, God's got you covered. Because if you look at verse 61, he says, and every kind of sickness and disease that's not recorded in the book of the law. He said also every sickness and every plague which is not written. Every one. Every one of them. So what have you been dealing with? And what have you been trying to get God to set you free of? He's just let you know that anything and everything you can come up with, Jesus already paid the price. He already became that. He already redeemed you from it. He went into the slave market. He purchased you. He paid for you. He brought you out of the kingdom of darkness and put you over into the kingdom of light so you could be a child of God. You could be uh, one with the firstborn. You could be a king and you could be a priest. You could be out from under the curse of the law and you could live under the blessing. So you could be in this world, but not of this world. Not have to live according to what the world says is normal. According to the, what the world says is normal. Say this with me. No more curse. I don't have any curse on me. I've already been set free. No more curse for me. I've already been set free. I'm not trying to get free. I'm not begging to get free. I'm not pleading to get free. I'm not giving to get free. I'm not praying to get free. I'm not going to church to get free. I'm not serving to get free. I'm not reading to get free. I am free. I am free. Because if you're depending on those things to get free, then you are depending on your works and not the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood sets you free. The blood sets you free. It's why the devil don't like people talking about the blood. It's why the media got so fed up and got so ticked off when the Passion of the Christ came out and they said, my God, don't take your kids to that movie. It's too bloody and it's too gory. Now, they didn't talk about that with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and they didn't talk about that with all, you know, Freddy Krueger. They didn't talk about any of that. But you start talking about the blood of Jesus Christ and you start riling up all of hell because Satan knows that is what defeated him. And if he can keep you ignorant of what the blood of Jesus did for you, he can keep you sick, he can keep you poor, he can keep you depressed, he can keep you addicted, and ultimately he'll kill you. 
But when you know what the blood of Jesus Christ did for you. See, we're all about confession. But if your confession is not based in the blood of Jesus Christ, your confession is based on nothing. You can't have faith in God without having faith in the blood of Jesus because it's the blood that provided it all. It's the blood that set you free. It's the blood that redeemed you and set you free from everything you read here in Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 61. Set you free of all of it. So you don't have to put up with it. You don't have to accept that as being normal. Come on, we have been called to live a very extraordinary, supernatural life. That means that our life, our lifestyle, should be above average, should be far beyond what the world considers to be normal. When the world is sick with something, you and I shouldn't be sick with that because we've already been set free of it because Jesus already became that. He already became it. If the sin problem has been done away with, then the curse problem has been done away with. See, people sit there and say, I don't understand why God hasn't healed me. Oh, come on, come on, we need to back up. Let me ask you a question. Has He forgiven you? Has He forgiven you? If He has forgiven you, He has also already healed you. It's already been provided. You just need to realize, Meh. you need to step up, plant your feet on the ground, and realize you're already free. I'm telling you, this revelation for people that it's already been done, it's already been taken care of. This is why in meetings when we go out and we're doing healing services and stuff, people are getting healed just sitting in their chairs. Nobody's praying for them. Nobody's laying hands on them. Why? Because they're waking up to the fact I don't have to work anymore. I'm not putting my faith in my works. I'm putting my faith in the grace of God and the blood of Jesus who already did the work for me, who already worked for me, set me free of all of this mess. So all I've got to do is live life loving Him and go out and be a deliverer for people. But see, I can't be a deliverer for people if I don't know I'm even delivered. How can you go and set people free if you're trying to get free? See, we as Christians, we can't even focus on other people because we're having to be focused on ourselves. And it's not a knock against anybody. It's because we just haven't, we haven't realized, we haven't read this thing and taken it for what it's worth. We don't have a problem saying that I'm forgiven, but a lot of people have a problem saying I'm healed. But he's already telling you. It is the truth. Where you find one, you find the other. It's a package deal. Psalm 103 verses 1 through 3 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that's within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. Who does what? Who forgives all your iniquities, forgives all your sins, and He heals all of your diseases. If He was willing to do that under the old covenant, for people who were putting their faith in the blood of a goat, how much more so do you think He already did it for somebody who puts their faith in the Son, and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ? The firstborn from the dead, the King of kings, and the Lord of Lords who sat down because you are redeemed. Hallelujah. Well, I'm excited tonight. I don't know what's wrong with you. If you don't get excited about that, I don't think there's any help for you. I don't know.